Howdy folks, I'm Keith Bowen. This is Hard Rock University. The next principle I'm going to try and make somewhat clear as much as possible in my extractive metallurgy uh, series here, mini-series, is something called counter-current material movement, where you've got two different material flows that are going in opposite directions. Now, this would usually be a liquid and a solid going opposite directions. This does not apply so much to physical separations like a gravity separation or flotation, unlike the uh, rougher cleaner scavenger circuit does, but this applies mainly to solutions and solids, whether you're dissolving them or adsorbing them onto a, like carbon for example, this improves the efficiency of that by uh, optimizing the, the kinetics. Okay, this principle is used primarily in leaching circuits. Now the reason you use it is because the kinetics of dissolution and absorption are affected by both the concentration of the valuable material in the solution, typically gold. I'll just use gold as an example. Um, and how much is adsorbed onto the recovery material. Usually activated carbon, although they have ion exchange resins now that, that are used more frequently than they used to be. So you have the gold and an adsorbent. And as you're absorbing the gold into the adsorbent, it becomes more and more difficult to get more gold into it. So what you want to do is create a circumstance whereby the most concentrated solution is used to expose your most loaded adsorbent first and then moving to less and less loaded adsorbent as it proceeds through the system and becomes more and more depleted. As you can see, this requires a little bit of trickery. It's not very complicated, but you do have to take active measures to maximize your recovery and minimize the amount of adsorbent required, the amount of recovery equipment needed to get the gold back out of the adsorbent. I'll just use the term carbon or resin for now instead of adsorbent. Okay, this is a rough diagram of the circuit that existed at the chemical Picacho mine where I used to work. And it's a fairly simple circuit. We had a heap leach. It doesn't matter what, how you get the stuff into solution, the gold into solution, heap leach, tank leach, agitated tank leach, vat leach, doesn't matter. Okay? Nikunj over there in Tanzania, they have just concrete vats and the, the carbon is just in almost like troughs. But it still works. We used what they call a fluidized bed carbon column. The solution came in the bottom and the particles were kind of lifted and expanded by the upwelling. And it was really interesting to see because it, it didn't look so much like a circulating upwelling. The carbon would just kind of rise up when you turned on the flow. It was kind of cool. The advantage of a fluidized bed column is that the carbon particles are equally exposed to the solution. You get very even loading. You don't have dead spots, so to speak. Okay. The problem is it's all being equally loaded. If you had just one like giant carbon column, you'd have to have a really big one to get good recoveries. So they do it with multiple columns, and here's how they do it. First of all, when you have fresh carbon, that would be put in this column here. This is the last column in the circuit, and this would be the cleanest carbon, the, the, the least loaded. The leaching circuit, the solution would come in here. In this case, we had gravity flow to maintain the flow through everything, so they're literally physically higher. The solution comes in, goes through the carbon in the first column, overflows, comes down, goes to the second column, 
overflows, comes down to the next. We had four columns. I've simplified. <laughs> and the last column would have the least loaded carbon. And I forget, I know that we would smelt like once a week, but I don't know if we change carbon columns once a week. I think it was like every two or three days we'd actually cycle the carbon columns one position. But anyhow, when you'd cycle this, you'd take the stripped carbon from the last stripping cycle, move it into the first slot, the first slot will move into the second, the second will move into the third, and this would go down to the stripping cycle. Big circulation of carbon like this. So that each batch of carbon, each column, was being exposed to a solution more in keeping with its loading factor. The most concentrated loading would have the most concentrated solution. The least concentrated loading would have the least concentrated solution. This allows you to build up the highest loading factor possible without losing too much out the end. And once it was loaded, it would be sent to a stripping circuit. We used a very hot cyanide and lye solution. This stuff was extremely dangerous. The, the leaching circuit, the pH was only about 10. The cyanide was in t fractions of a percent. And, I mean, you could actually take a sip of that without hurting yourself. Wouldn't recommend it, but it was actually... The, the pregnant solution coming out of the heap at the uh, Goldfields mine that I worked at actually had less cyanide per pound than is allowed in wheat flour by the FDI. So it didn't take much to dissolve it. It does take a lot to get it back off of the carbon. So this was running pH of 14, 2% cyanide, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. It was some nasty stuff. You splash that on you, you could, you'd get a horrible burn, both chemical and thermal, and you could very easily get a lethal dose of cyanide right through your skin. So this was a very limited area. It was in a cage because we're actually recovering the gold, and it was very dangerous. Now, that hot solution would be percolated through the carbon. It would dissolve the gold out of the carbon, bring it over here to an electrolytic cell where we plated it onto steel wool. Later on we take the steel wool, dissolve it in acid, which leaves the gold, mix it with a flux and smelt it into bars. Very common process. But once it was stripped, it would be moved back to this right here. Now you'll notice the solution is flowing this way and the carbon is moving this way. Now it's moving in steps, but nevertheless it's moving that way. That's why it's called counter current. The carbon is moving against the flow of solution. And that's why you would do it. Now here's another way you can do this. Instead of using a fluidized bed column, you can use a packed bed column. This is typically just a pipe. It's got screens in both ends to contain the adsorbent material. This is more commonly used with resins. Resins have higher loading factors, they're more expensive, they're very uniform, they're in beads, they don't crumble and flake, etc. So they just have certain characteristics that make them more suitable for a packed bed column. Put a screen in there, you just fill it up with the resin, put the other end on, and it holds it in place, and it's a porous medium. Okay? The beads don't move. As such, when you put the solution in this end, and it's going this way. It's a very concentrated solution. It's loading the uh, resin. And there comes a point where this resin at this end becomes as loaded as it can get for that solution, or close to it. And that front moves down the column until it gets to this end. That's when you take that column out of circuit and do just like here. You take it, move it to stripping, and everything moves ahead one. This would be more likely to be used in a um, micro scale operation because of the high efficiencies. It's, it's much smaller. You use a, a, a resin which has higher loading factors. Um, and I say it would just, this would be more suitable for a small scale thing like, say, you're leaching concentrate. Say I was 
leaching the concentrates from Mojave One. I got 200 pounds of concentrates a day. I can put in a barrel, I can dissolve it, I can stir it up, I can bring that solution around, send it through a, carbon, uh, a column like this, and load that gold into that and then move that off to a stripping circuit pretty darn easily. You know, you just... These, they each had like a ton of carbon in them. It's of course a much bigger operation, 3,000 ounces a month. But these we'd have to forklift. So this is more suitable for a small-scale operation uh, in general. And you do the same thing, you have multiple, something like a micro scale, you probably have like two. One to load and one to scavenge. And you just circulate it through until it was pretty well stripped. Now, you can also do a similar thing with carbon in leach. Um, let's suppose that these were agitation leach tanks instead of carbon tanks, okay? You had finely crushed ore, cyanide solution is poured in this tank and it's being stirred. You might have a big impeller. Uh, with carbon you normally wouldn't want any excess agitation because it's going to grind it up and you're going to lose that fine uh, powdered carbon. But let's say you have a nice uh, big slow propeller impeller on the bottom just to stir things up. You put the raw ore in here, and then as it comes through here, it overflows and keeps working its way this way. Now this would take days. You're typically talking two to four days at least to go through something like this, sometimes a week or more, depending upon various factors. But you have a screen on this outfall so that this carbon is stuck in this thing. If you're crushing the ore to say, well, and crush it and, and you screen it. For, in this case, you really would want to screen it after the crushing to say 100% passing 50 mesh. And the carbon was 16 mesh plus. It's real easy to keep the carbon here while allowing the ore to go there. That's called carbon in pulp or carbon in leach. The difference is if you have agitation tanks up here, where it's actually being leached, you're getting real violent with it and this and that and the other, and then you just run it through these carbon recovery systems, that would be a carbon in pulp. If you actually have it leaching and the carbon absorbing it at the same time, that's called carbon in leach. And again, the whole idea is with the kinetics. The less gold there is in solution, the easier it is to suck some out of the rock, and the more of that gold you get into the carbon and out of the solution, the faster you can do that process. Also, you want, if you're doing both at the same time, you have to have less tankage in general. Again, it's all individually determined. <laughs> there's, there's a lot more smarter people than I with a lot more equipment than me that figure out when it makes sense to do what. But that's another way you would have a countercurrent system. You've got your ore and your leach solution, you know, powdered ore this way, your carbon being held in the tanks and then advanced as time goes on, and then the stuff from the lead tank would come in here and be uh, stripped, then sent back. So that's what countercurrent is all about. When you have kinetics going on in solution, you want to try and create an environment that varies over location to optimize dissolution and absorption depending upon what you're doing at what spot. But that's what countercurrent materials movement is all about. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, if you're using leach solutions, Please make sure you read the instructions because these can be pretty nasty things. Don't try leaching if you don't know exactly how to do it and take the appropriate safety and legal precautions because it's some bad stuff, okay, or it can be. Some of it's pretty safe, but you need to learn which and what and how. Anyhow, hope it was helpful and happy prospecting. Keep it safe out there.